Welcome back, Red Spotters, to another show here on the Red Spotlight Entertainment Podcast. I'm your host today, Alexis J. Soto, joined by Mr. Peter Martinez. We are here to finally finish our Guillermo del Toro series, in which we go back and look at the 10 films directed by this decorated filmmaker. The previous installments, we covered the film's Kronos, The Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth, that's in part one, and in part two we covered Blade 2, Hellboy 1 and 2, as well as Pacific Rim. Uh, Interestingly enough, they both had their different themes. The first part was pretty much his Spanish language fairy tales, and the second installment were his blockbusters. And today we're going to be covering in our final installment three films that seemingly have no coalescing theme but i'm pretty sure the master of themes over there mr martinez will find something (laughs) by the end of the show and that is mimic from 1997 crimson peak from 2015 and the shape of water from 2017 which ultimately ended up winning best picture at the academy awards so that is going to be red spotlight number 291 how are y'all doing? We hope that you're doing well, and thank you for listening to these uh, wonderful commentaries and, you know, discussions on all we're doing. I'm having a blast, honestly, this month. Honestly, I'm having so much fun talking with Del Toro with you, talking British gossip with uh, the Miss Moreno, and then uh, WandaVision and Marvel stuff with David. It's <laughs> it's great. I love this month. What are you talking with Kyle? Seemingly nothing. I haven't actually spoken to kyle he's been busy we're supposed to be doing a doctor who review soon but um he'll let me know when (laughs) seems like a bit of shade on your part i mean i've not recorded a single podcast with kyle in the month of january so i mean but that being said you were gone for a month and a half and he stepped up to take your place in some of those parts so i mean i wouldn't be I'm pointing fingers. No, 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 no. The shade is you saying what a wonderful month it is. <laughs> and then having it conveniently be when you haven't... The, <laughs> the, difference, with Kyle. the difference between when I say that and when Kyle says that mm. is in those previous examples, like I'm sure there are a couple that are coming to your mind right now. When he says that, it is in a time when I'm actually recording with him. That's mm-hmm. shade. When he's not recording podcasts with me, period, that's something else differently. I reached out. He never gave me a date uh, about when he would be available for Doctor Who, so I'm moving on. And as far as Fantasy Fair, the first episode they did this year, um, I was invited, but I chose not to attend because I had a different engagement altogether. They had a review of Soul, I believe, and Mandalorian, which we've already covered uh, this month, you know, on Red Spotlight, so I felt it would be a bit redundant, but... um, you know, we're we're talking. We're we're trying to get some uh, episodes going. So that was totally necessary to just discuss the <laughs> schedule that we're planning on doing. But hey, that's kind of where we're at. I don't know. I want to say is I'm enjoying talking about Guillermo del Toro, and I have to say I'm so happy that we picked um, this person and, and you know to look back at their history because there's so much about him as a filmmaker that I personally connect with. Um, not just through his films, but, you know, through his philosophy and how he makes movies and how he talks about film. I have some stuff here that I've saved um, from one of his many interviews he's given, especially during the, the Shape of Water press tour that definitely caught my eye or my ear, shall I say, um, that is a pretty powerful and important conversation to have, you know, with film and everything. So, yeah. Yeah, I hope you're having a good time with this as well, even though the first installment was like two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always enjoy talking about things I like. It feels like it's really not, but it can feel sometimes like we rarely do that. So <laughs> True, it's especially true. since, you know, some of the content, especially I believe, and I, I have to on, be honest with you, we all expected just because we know each other and we often if you think that the red spotlight podcast is us screaming into the void it is but that's nothing compared to like our everyday you know texts back and forth and you know gearing into the mandalorian review i have to say i don't know what i expected 
I, I, I guess part of me was trying to be polite, but then it, it did become a pile on and it may be the single most negative podcast we've done in quite some time, which, you know, on the other side of it, I think that's, that's a good sign because, you know, usually we're criticized as being the most negative podcast in the history of podcasts. But to say that that was the most negative in quite some time, I think is a compliment, you know? <laughs> to be fair, we're the ones criticizing ourselves for being negative. Yeah. I don't think our, our, our two viewers have not reached out to us <laughs> and uh, given us feedback yet. Well, yeah. And those listening, we got more content coming your way. Don't don't uh, don't think that we are just like strolling along here. Uh, also, to the table, coming back in February, Peter and I. Yes, that's gonna be fun. Feel good February. It's about a year late, but we're finally doing it. So, uh, I think it's right on time. <laughs> I think there are uh, things in life that are just meant to happen when they happen. You know, I I'll tell you, I, I'll probably feel a lot better about this February than I felt about last February. So, oh, yes. You really can't compare the two. Um, I mean, one would hope, but we'll see when we get there. Yeah. So with that being said, <laughs> unless Bernie loses Nevada for a third time somehow yeah. in February, I don't see that. <laughs> well, we have a new president. You know, we're talking about mm -hmm. um, actual policy instead of like, you know, having a Diet Coke button installed in the Resolute desk. So I think the differences are immeasurable. We're not discussing, you know, crowd size or, you know, we're, we're discussing actual meaningful policy that will change people's lives and, you know, an actual address to the coronavirus pandemic. So, you know, I think by that measure alone, we're off to a much better start than last year um, in any, in oh, any yeah. regard. So, you know. We got to, you know, we got to roll with it. We got to make the best of it. So that's where we are. Um, so I think we can go ahead and get things started with Mimic. This came out in 1997. And I will, you know, warn people, um, if you haven't seen this movie, first of all, make sure you bring like a barf bag if you're going to watch this, because it is probably one of the most disgusting films I've ever seen in my life. And I mean, from a visual aspect not from a, a you know an aspect of content although that's never really been i think too much of an issue and it is uh uncharacteristically del toro in several ways um of which we will get into so without further ado mr martinez do you have the official description for this a bug's life movie <laughs> mimic Directed by Ryan Johnson. Oh my God. For thousands of years, man has been evolution's greatest creation. Until now. A disease carried by common cockroaches is killing Manhattan children. In an effort to stop the epidemic, an entom entomologist, Susan Tyler, creates a mutant breed of insect that secretes a fluid to kill the roaches. This mutant breed was engineered to die after one generation, but three years later, Susan finds out that the species has survived and evolved into a large, gruesome monster that can mimic human form. Starring Mira Sorvino, Josh Pearl, and a bunch of other people. Produced by Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, shit. That's right. <laughs> the Weinstein Company. You remember those people? They were definitely... Well, I can't even say they were people. Never mind. <laughs> oh, that probably would be a stretch uh, far. But they were involved in the financing of the film, so there is that. Um... I, I guess th this may be an example of one of those films where the making of is a lot more fascinating to discuss than maybe the story itself. And that's not to sell the movie short. Like with any of Del Toro's films, even some of the more basic installments like, you know, Pacific Rim, um, it, it may come across as fairly straightforward and one-dimensional. 
there are plenty of movies that can do that and be just as great, you know, in their own regard. And I think for the most part, um, this is a very, very well-made film. Uh, it is a story of, uh, I believe at this point we've seen many, many iterations of it. It is interesting, of course, that, uh, at least for me watching this film, you know, during the era of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, that didn't do any good for my nerves first and foremost. So there's that. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I guess at the end of the day, I, there wasn't, it didn't make that much more of an impression than I would have expected it. It's, it's a fair, fairly straightforward film. Um, but, it, but the, it's a nineties creature yeah, feature. Yeah. really. And that's kind of what's the most interesting part about it is the creature featureness of it. Uh, and because that would be the, basically the only part that leaves an impression on you, which is how vomit inducing many of the events that take place. Um, I guess it, it, it is a creature feature and there are horror elements to it when it comes to these monsters, basically killing people. Um, and that's very well done. So, watching the movie, I didn't pick up on any behind-the-scenes drama. So when, although at the very at the same time, I know the very artistic, you know, films that Del Toro has produced, you know, and so I did wonder, because and I also was aware that this was the first big, like I guess, American film, the first like big budget film that he that he got yeah. so i i mm -hmm. first american film yeah period. and so i figured perhaps that played into why the film was as straightforward and simplistic as it was and little did i realize of course that um there was more uh to it than than just that but at you know at the end of the day um if all this movie amounts to is you know being grossed out and I think on some level, that's what it was going for. Boy, does it do that and then some. Uh, yeah, it's creepy as shit. It's cool, though. You know, it, it's nice. The creature stuff was definitely neat. <laughs> the grossness, A+. <laughs> um, I think Guillermo has talked about his fascination of insects mm -hmm. before. I have... Um, a book on Guillermo del Toro and talking about his home, which his home is just a museum of the macabre and the creepy and, you know, all of the above as far as that, what that might come to mind. But there's a section where he has, you know, like insects, not the, I don't, not the live ones, but you know, you see when they put them in behind glass and right. stuff like that. He's very big on insects so, you know, when I read that, I was like, okay, Mimic makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> As to what he was, what he was going for with the film. Um, I can, I think I can tell where you can see the two films, right? Like you can see the more out there Guillermo del Toro film. And you can see the studio, you know, these are the beats you need to hit to have your creature mm -hmm. featured. These are the characters, you know, these are the twists, the turns, third act, middle act, and you need to hit these marks and da 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 da, da. you know, that of, of the kind of shit you would get if you were hired to make a studio creature feature standard that would be in the 90s. Um, I think you can see both those films in there. I, yeah, like at the end of the day, it's not a bad film. I don't feel, <laughs> which is pretty incredible when you listen to the way um, Guillermo yeah. talks about it. Like he, he talks about making this film and it's like, it was his hell. And I don't know if he spoke this openly before all the shit with Weinstein came out, but 
I have heard him talk about the whole situation, and you have mm -hmm. too. And that's really where the most fascinating stuff with this film I right. think lies, because um, he's not what seems to me an angry guy, but when Mimic comes up, oh boy, <laughs> he gets pretty fiery. And he almost, oh, yeah. I, I, whenever, and, you know, at this point, um, because of, you know, when I, when we do these particular series, like with Scorsese, I, I really want to immerse myself in not just the films that this person made, but then also who this person, you know, is and what better way than do that in several interviews, right? And that can be challenging sometimes if you have certain people who are not that, you know, engaging, but no, but he is easily one of the most engaging people in an interview. He gives you so many wonderful little tidbits and, and nuggets of information that ha that really speak to who he is. But um, all of the stuff that I did see of that being mentioned, it was post the Weinstein scandal, uh, which was at the very beginning of the Me Too movement. And I don't know, when I see... Whenever it came to that part in the interview, there's this look on his face where he's just so gleefully happy that he can now, with no persecution, risk of persecution whatsoever from the Hollywood insiders, that he can trash that disgusting, horrible man as much as he wants. No, he goes in. He doesn't hold back. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, leave apart... And I know that's kind of a hard thing to do. All the disgusting, you know, stuff that makes up Mr. Weinstein. Who is now in, who's this, now in prison, um, by the way. I don't know if we ever discussed that because when, when the Weinstein allegations did come up back in 2017, we discussed them up front. But we should say that yeah. he's in prison now. He was found guilty and that's a great thing, you know. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. I'd like... I. <laughs> I give two fucks about what happens to him. I don't consider him a human mm -hmm. at this point. Like, fuck him. Um, like Del Toro tells us in his I, movies, he's the real monster. <laughs> um, this has happened before. Like, it, it's they're similar stories. Uh, the the one that uh guillermo has told regarding just the bullshit that he had to go through when making the film uh with uh, harvey weinstein that there are other directors and artists that have been under weinstein that have had to deal with that same bullshit too um one of the people that came forward with of course you know a sort of uh, sexual assault allegation but also it was kind of tied into the film as well as Selma Hayek when she did um, what's her the what's her name the painter um, what painter Frida Kahlo oh, Frida Kahlo yeah the film okay. have you seen no. it well it, 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 she made the, the, the Frida Kahlo she played Frida Kahlo like it was a whole thing like trying trying to get that film made and I guess, you know, Harvey Weinstein put her through hell and, and, and did all kinds of things. And I think he was the one that demanded, like, a lesbian sex scene. And, like, he, like, basically to get her naked and stuff like that. And she did it just because she knew if she didn't, the film would not be made. And really disgusting stuff, mm -hmm. obviously. But it, it's that kind of thing where coming in and just fucking with the film horribly... Um, Bong Joon Ho was it Bong Joon Ho? Uh, when he did uh, Snowpiercer, and he talks about, <laughs> I I I sent you the the quote, didn't I? I believe you did at one point. I don't recall what it was though. <laughs> um, he was talking about the headaches he was having <laughs> with uh with Weinstein, like with the cuts, cuts, because like he's really famous for his yeah. like, cuts. Like, people deliver him in a film, and he's like, I got to cut this, 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 and it's, like, ridiculous. And I guess they wa he wanted to cut the shot when they're in the train car and they're fighting. Do you remember? Like, they get an right. axe, and they, like, put it through the fish. And I guess, like, it was going to be gone. <laughs> and Bong Joon-ho just made up some story, like, no, my, like, my father was a fisherman. You know, that shot's in there for my father. <laughs> 
and then Weinstein was like, <laughs> "Oh my god!" <laughs> yeah. And then Weinstein was like, "Oh, you know, you know, family's everything." Okay, I'll, I'll leave in the shot. And then Bong Joon's Hall is like, "I, I, I lied. I, my dad was never a fisherman." <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, like right now, I've I've been watching the Miyazaki mm-hmm. films for the first time, Hayao Miyazaki, and. That's another, um, I can't remember what, I don't know if it was Kiki's delivery service or it might've been that one that when he, cause I think the Weinsteins were going to do the American release first. And I think that was before they struck a deal with Disney or no, no, no. Weinstein, weren't they owned by Disney? So, um, one particular studio that really isn't around much anymore, at least not that I'm aware of, is Miramax Films. And Miramax Films was basically Disney's um, outlet for R-rated material, which the Weinsteins owned, I believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was something like that. It's it's all interconnected in that way. Capitalism. Uh, and he sent him a samurai sword with the added note, that said no cuts. So he basically oh, threatened. <laughs> Miyazaki did that or one of his people? Yes. No. Well, he, I think someone asked him and he says, well, well, I didn't send it. My assistant sent it. But he, you know, <laughs> that's some, you know, that's some glub bullshit. <laughs> He said he just had his assistants. Wow. It, or one of the producers or something. But I, he didn't get any cuts. <laughs> and they were talking about the American distribution of that movie? Okay. Yes. Or, or yeah. Because, and, and you know what? I, I have to say, this may be a future to the table theme to do the Miyazaki films. Because I, I would like to see them as well. And I'm sure you have plenty to talk about them. I've seen, I think, maybe one or two. Oh, yeah. One or two of his movies I've seen. Um, the man is fascinating himself. Yeah, yeah, and but those films again, animation is treated with reverence and respect. Everything it's not here in America, and like those films are yeah. so successful, you know, over there. Whereas here, like they're so successful to the point where like the idea to like cut any scenes from a Miyazaki movie would be, um sacrilege yeah I, I i think i read one article on him comparing him to like an american count counterpart would be modern day would be like steven spielberg mm. but even i don't think even steven spielberg doesn't have that sort of not at least not today that weight to him i i don't know what uh, like in terms of how much he's loved by the people? Yeah, well, within his medium, right. like revered. You I, know what I mean? Today, I don't know who that would I, be. That's right. Um, no, I don't know who that would be either. Um, Tom Hanks? He, everybody loves that actor, I guess. I don't know. I'm just throwing out names. <laughs> but it's not It's not like necessarily a love, just like a, res- a love slash respect of... The quality oh, of... Oh, Marty. Everybody loves oh. Marty Scorsese. From the people in the crafts work in the world? Yeah, that's him. Yeah, but like... I guess my thing is like... He doesn't get his respect, I feel. When he's out here oh, begging... Well, oh, yeah, that's true. To, to try and to get his film that's made. That's a different thing. And... I mean, I, I meant to say that like... He, yeah. In almost any film circle, the film fans... But perhaps the business aspect mm-hmm. of it... Well, that's a different story, as we all know. Okay. Um, I wanted to actually give more detail on what you were speaking to. I found some great stuff, um, on the you know on the making of this movie. Um, but then I'll. Well, I just wanted yes. to to set the precedent that like this, <laughs> what Guillermo went through was not. Oh unique. no, no, not at all. And I think that that's <laughs> this guy was a piece that of sword work. story was hilarious. Um, I have here from IndieWire, Guillermo del Toro visited the BFI London Film Festival to screen his acclaimed awards contender, The Shape of Water, 
and to participate in one of the festival's director talks. I believe you and I have seen part of that. The conversation inevitably touched upon Harvey Weinstein. The media mogul has been fired from the one. This is a dated article, just to be clear about that. Um, and, and Del Toro worked alongside Weinstein on the production of Mimic during the Miramax days. So I think this indicates Miramax has kind of shuttered for a long time. Um, so that means Disney owns Mimic? I would say so, yeah, because that's how they own the um, Pulp Fiction, because that's a Miramax film, isn't it? Technically, yeah. Um, Coming to you on Disney+. Right. Plus. Let's just say Del Toro does not think fondly of Weinstein. Here's what he says. I really hated the experience, Del Toro said to a crowd at the festival. My first American experience was almost my last because it was with the Weinsteins and Miramax. I've got to tell you, Two horrible things happened in the late 90s. My father was kidnapped, and I worked with the Weinstein. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> he feels some type of way. And then he... Hold up. He says... He, he goes on. I know which one was worse. The kidnapping made more sense. I knew what they wanted. <laughs> During his conversation, the director did admit that dealing with the Weinstein brothers taught him how to fight. He said he was told during one of his first meetings with Merrimax that the company would prohibit him from depicting any violence against animals or children. But he decided to film a scene where two children and a dog die just to rebel against the Weinstein's rule. <laughs> he says, I don't know if this is much of an achievement, but I felt like one. Del Toro said, he says, I lost casting battles. I lost story battles. But the one thing Mimic is visually 100, 100% exactly what I wanted. The movie is visually gorgeous, and it has a couple of sequences I'm very proud of. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I would agree with every word of that when it comes to the film. Visually, it is really nice. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> I also understand that casting and story-wise, it's like, eh, this ain't entirely Guillermo here. <laughs> No Ron Perlman, so there goes that. How much you want to bet he was trying to hire him? Probably for for any for any character, and they're like, no, he's I ugly. assume da, Doug da, 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 Jones da, da. was the creatures, right? I just assume cause he's in every movie he makes. Do you know that for a fact? I I have I guess I can look it up. I Actually, no yes, he is. I see him. He's he's. I have the casting list here. He is a uh, Long John number oh, two. Oh yeah, he is. I think that's when their relationship started mm. is Mimic. I have... Because he was... I remember one of the, the quotes him saying, like, he was just one of the people in the suits mm -hmm. or whatever, and he needed to get to get a shot. And I think one of the people just wasn't doing mm -hmm. it correctly. So then he asked Doug Jones... You know who's on, and then like first try, boom, he got it. What he was looking for. So then I think that from there, of course, a beautiful friendship. <laughs> <laughs> I've got more here actually on uh, on the behind the scenes. This one is specific to this movie, so back on that. After Miramax boss Bob Weinstein saw early footage, there were fights between him and Del Toro regarding the tone, with Weinstein claiming the film was not scary enough. It has been reported that one day, Weinstein was so infuriated with Del Toro that he stormed onto the Toronto set and attempted to instruct Del Toro on, quote, how to direct a movie. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I guarantee you that pissed him off. This happens quite a bit. Do you remember that infamous, um, I don't know if I ever shared this with you, but one of the roundtable extras on The Incredibles. That's on the Pixar Blu-ray. Um, Brad Bird remembers almost quitting the movie because Michael Eisner, the head Disney chief at the time, was telling him, was trying to tell him what works and doesn't work in animation. <laughs> this happens quite a bit, it seems. 
So, um, go. Well, I think it's it's because you have these heads that have over, overseen like these wildly successful mm-hmm. films, and I think they get it in their head. Like, yeah, I I know what I'm doing. Right. Like, like I just you, I I got the stuff. I I know how to pick winners and losers, and you know, you just need to listen to me, kid. You know, this kind of I. And that's not to say that studio notes are always wrong, because sometimes they can. The be best right. example I think is Star Wars. the The studio notes were kind of saved that movie because the original concept, the original designs for some of these characters were they weren't going to work. They just weren't going to work. I think budget saved that movie <laughs> <laughs> because they're on such a hamstring budget. Uh, George couldn't do some of anything, literally anything that popped into his head. So it, it 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 held him back, I think, for the better. <laughs> um, George Lucas's imagination is best when it's on the leash, at least from what I I've agree seen. with you. Yeah, and you know, and I believe we've talked about this on the fantasy fair. At least we will. But like, you know, everybody knows that time with you know with the Michael Eisner situation. It wasn't just that, but like he was Pixar was really upset with him at that during the making of that movie that they basically had all but decided to walk away and go do business with other studios, with other distributors. Um, which really? is what basically, um, that was one of the reasons why I believe it was Roy E. Disney basically staged a coup and got rid of him. And then one of the first things that Bob Iger did was to purchase Pixar because of how badly um, that bond between Pixar and Disney was dead, basically, so. It's a really interesting history. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's so funny that uh, Bob Iger's first move as the head of Disney was to purchase yeah. another right. studio and cement their right. power. <laughs> Which, by the way, is not unique to him. Like Eisner did the same thing too in his tenure. He purchased uh, ABC Television Network, among other things. That's what they do. Yeah, I know, but I mean, Bob oh, took yeah, it to another level. Did. Iger, yeah, I mean. Bob Iger. Um, back to, uh, uh, to the rest of this thing with, uh, with Mimic I was reading here. Weinstein would eventually try and get Del Toro fired. Following an intervention from lead actress Mira Servino, Weinstein backed down, and principal photography would be completed with Del Toro as director in early 97. However, Weinstein still insisted on having control over the final cut. Producer B.J. Rack later, later, excuse me, compared making the film to being a prisoner of a war camp. While Del Toro stated in 2018, the only time I have experienced bad behavior, and it remains one of the worst experiences of my life, was in 97 when I did Mimic for Miramax. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. <laughs> So tell us how you really feel, <laughs> Mr. Del Toro. Um, yeah. But that being said, as well, I think the I don't think you would pick up on all of these things if you just watched the movie. It seems to have like it holds together rather well. It doesn't come across as a movie that like is barely hanging on by a thread, or that you know that there are movies you can tell that there were behind the scenes like edits and changes like i think some of the best examples were like rogue one and solo you can definitely tell there was there's been some tinkering um with stuff going on but with mimic you don't see that and again um i want to stress this the best part of the movie of course is visually what's his and these monsters are disgusting they are some of the most disgusting yes. things you'll ever see. And if you look, you're, I like, I them. mean, <laughs> they're terrifying too, honestly, in some of these sequences. So I'm not sure what the Weinstein guy was saying that it wasn't scary enough, but I mean, it, it, it isn't surprising for an executive to say something like that. We've, we've known of all these stories over the years that this happens, but, um, good for Del Toro though, for winning the fight on killing a kids and a dog. That seemed pretty, uh, that seemed to be a massive win for him. Yeah, I I hate when films just don't have the balls to do that. Especially kill Halloween, kids. the recent like, Halloween movie did pretty brutally. Yeah, 
I thought they were going to go all the way and kill a baby. Now that's unforgivable in 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 filmmaking. Um but they didn't go there. Though in all honesty, I think Michael the real Michael Myers would have stabbed that baby like nonchalantly. I I I have to wonder that would have been a, a bridge too far for most audiences. Yeah, no, I agree. It, they, you would have lost the audience. Um, that's why I wouldn't have put the baby there, though. Because <laughs> you would have lost the audience. Yeah. Or you could have at least have him go for it and then someone stop him. Or, But, you know, I'm not directing Halloween. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's all I got to say on Mimic. There's not much. Yeah, I think it's definitely at toward the very bottom of his uh, filmography. Again, it's not a bad yeah. movie by any means. It's a, it's a fairly decent, entertaining watch, but it it just it lacks a lot of the um, originality and creativity. And I think what's really missing is um, intellectual, intellectually stimulating, and um, probably characters. I mean, they're not really characters in this movie. They're just they're they're very standard, I guess. I mean, they're, they're yeah, they're, they're there. there. So like you know. That's that. So, shall we talk about the Crimson Peak? Yes. Um, give me fifty-eight seconds. Oh, you have plenty of time, man. We, we're here all day and all night. Otherwise, how do we record like well, no, ten I, podcasts I, in a week? I need to watch the new uh, Wandavision. Oh, that's true. That's very true. which thank you for plugging because we're doing weekly WandaVision recaps here on Red Spotlight with our lovely Mr. David Francisco. So keep an eye out for those that we've having a really good time watching that show. All right. Crimson Peak directed by Martin Scorsese. Love. <laughs> I do it just because of the faces you make. It's awesome. It's so random. Love makes monsters of us all in the aftermath of a family tragedy an aspiring author is torn between love for her childhood friend and the temptation of a mysterious outsider trying to escape the ghosts of her past she is swept away to a house that breathes bleeds and remembers cast includes mia last name <laughs> included Jessica Chastain Tom Hiddleston and Charlie Hunnam as well as um, what's his name Jim Beaver other actors Doug Jones is in there as always as the, the ghastly creature. before we start I have some production um, notes if you want to just to add on more to this. Oh, go ahead. All right. I'm having this. Uh, all right. So Del Toro and Robbins wrote the original script um, after the release of Pan's Labyrinth. It was sold quietly to Universal and he planned to do it, but he obviously, this goes into a long tangent of other projects. Then he made Hellboy. Then he was working for the Hobbit movies. Um, and then while directing Pacific Rim, Del Toro developed a good working relationship with legendary pictures as Thomas Toll and John Johnsony, who asked what he wanted to do next. Del Toro sent them this his screenplays for a film adaptation. Oh boy, this is <laughs> at the Mountains of Madness. Oh, uh, the, yeah. the producers seemed, um, which that was, of course, that was the previous one that was canceled. Um, and then Crimson Peak. The producers deemed the last of these the best project for us, just the right size. Universal allowed Del Toro to move the project, the legendary, with the caveat that they could put up money for a stake in the film. Del Toro called the film a ghost story and gothic romance. He described it as a very set-oriented, classical, but at the same time modern take on the ghost story and said that it would allow him to play with the genre's conventions while subverting their rules. He stated, I think people are getting used to horror subjects done as found footage or B-value budgets. I wanted this to feel like a throwback. 
Del Toro wanted the film to honor the grand dames of the haunted house genre, namely Robert Weiss's The Haunting and Jack Clayton's The Innocents. The director intended to make a large-scale horror film in the tradition of those he grew up watching, such as The Omen, The Exorcist, and The Shining. He cited the latter, let's say The Shining, um, another Ma- as another Mount Everest of the haunted house movie, praising the high production values of Stanley Kubrick's control over the large sets. Um, okay, that's uh, that's <laughs> all the basically pre-production stuff that went into it. But that's um, just added notes for uh, the film. So, how did you feel about it? I remember. You telling me a while back, I think it may have been around the Academy Awards when Del Toro was up, and that would be for The Shape of Water. And I, th- or it may have even been when uh, we saw The Shape of Water, in fact, um, in this, in the same year. Um, you said something to the effect that you weren't really that big of a fan of this film in a way that you usually are with many of del toro's films i believe that was what you said at the time now considering how so many of your opinions have changed and you know not to single you out because all of ours Mm -hmm. in any uh particular frame or lens if you will has evolved as we should right we're growing people but that was my that was what I recalled or what I gathered is that you weren't necessarily that big of a fan of it. Um, now I saw the movie, and uh, I didn't love it. I enjoyed it, and I am struggling exactly where to place this in terms of why it was at least so low for me. Like, I would think that Mimic not... So you, so you agree with Mimic me. notwithstanding this, by all appearance, you know, when I'm looking at all of the other movies that he's made, I didn't necessarily care all that much. Which is really strange. Yeah. It's really strange. The performances are good. Um, the sets are beautiful. Gorgeous. And it's interesting because he mentions this movie in several interviews. He really loved making this movie, and he really loves this, this movie. But this isn't one of those that I'll go back and watch again. It's not awful by any means but at the same time it um there are there are some interesting things that can go off that caught my my eye in the movie in terms of a design standpoint but it uh oh uh, you just reminded me that you we did have a theme for these three films the interlocking theme this is the disgusting category because that's right because (laughs) that's yeah. Yeah, I remember saying Yeah, this is the disgusting category, and I just remembered what was disgusting about mm-hmm. it as well. Um, I enjoyed it, but I also don't seem to care all that much about it. Yeah, I would agree. And I saw, I saw this in theaters. I've been a lof- long, li- long, lifelong... Um, del toro fanatic i guess and yeah this one just doesn't again on paper it's like oh wow all the things i love rolled into one this this is a no-brainer you know hit for me and then i watch it and it's like it's just not it's just not it's not bad it's good i enjoy it but it's it doesn't have staying power with me and there's a few reasons for that. Maybe the biggest, though, is to me, it's a gothic romance 
where the romance just doesn't hit. That's true. Um, that's very true. That doesn't it doesn't come anywhere close to hitting, and that's pretty surprising for him because I think he usually mm-hmm. would nail that. But yeah, I believed the love between the love of a mute woman and a fish. Yeah, yeah, a million times more than anything going on here. Like the 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 romance just did not work. And then also he talks about like subverting the genre and stuff, but it really wasn't. I remember, and when I was a kid, I watched this, and from the very beginning, I was like, "Okay, this is going to be the entire story," and then it was. <laughs> From the very beginning. Well, I mean, there's one detail that I didn't guess, which is part of the disgusting factor. <laughs> but <laughs> everything else, like who the nef- who was the real nefarious character and this and that. And it's like, yeah, it's it's going to be this. And that's it's not bad. I, I, I don't think having a, a predictable film is necessarily bad. But when it's this like semi mystery, so to speak, um, when a lot of the film hinges on that, uh, when the answer is already obvious from the beginning, it, it's just it's very hard for it to hold you. Mm. You know what I mean? So then you go like, OK, well, what about the romance? The romance just I think is just it doesn't work at all. I don't. Which one? I don't. I see. I didn't even know it was till that description. I didn't know it was like a three row tr- love triangle. Oh, I guess technically it already was right. Cause with the sister. Right. So it's a love square. I don't know. <laughs> I, Cause I guess they're counting Charlie Hunnam. I never counted Charlie. Hunnam. No. It's part of no, the equation. I don't, I, by the end. No, not really. Even then, I don't know. He just seems like a friend. Yeah. I, mm, but yeah, the, the sort of mystery and the romance are just lacking. Yeah, severely lacking in in my case. So then, like, what does that leave? Atmosphere and the the spooky mm-hmm. ghosts. Those two do work. I agree. They absolutely do. I agree. Visually, it's stunning. Um, The ghosts are gorgeous. Unsettling in moments. Yeah. All of that, I think, works. Everything else is just very boilerplate. Yeah. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And no, and like, I, I agree. I've seen a lot of instances where... Guillermo really loves this film. I, I think he really loves this film that he made. And like when he talks about the films he's comparing them to, mm-hmm. I'm like, damn, like I I wish I would have got that film. <laughs> yeah. You know? Because in the past, he'll talk about his influences and it's like, oh, yeah, no, I see it. Like it's there. It, it's that kind of film. You know, with all of his Mexican films and his blockbusters, you know, he talks about what those influences are. And yeah, like for sure. But here it's. uh, It just feels very standard. I don't remember if if it was someone on Twitter I saw or if it were if it was a, a review of. Uh, from last year but that someone had compared the haunting of blind manor as a better version of crimson peak yeah yeah which by the way we have a review of if you want to listen to it here on on the mm-hmm. feed which was very very good so the, at least there um the the romance it, works more than right? then, more than works it's really mm-hmm. well done 
and I I I really like Bly Manor, and I have my issues with Bly Manor too, but the mystery, even though some of it is predictable, there's a lot there that isn't, right? Yeah. So it keeps you going throughout the way it's it's sort of built up. Um, obviously, it's not as visually impressive um you know either from the ghost perspective right. or the house mm-hmm. or you know the atmosphere that del toro can mm-hmm. create obviously it's not at that level but the romance the emotion is there the passion is there for sure you know mm-hmm. and it's not at all yeah present with crimson Peak. i think that's that's what hurts it because when i think um gothic romance i really do think passion right right like like it feels passionate and this film is just devoid of that passion when it comes to its human characters which really holds it back for me so yeah this is and and this is the thing too right like it's it wasn't studio interference he made the movie he he very clearly wanted to make he loves the movie he made it's just one of those things where it's to me it's just it's just a miss. Mm. <laughs> it's one of those rare like we can't chalk it up to this, we can't chalk it up to that. It's just I it's just one of those where it's like, yeah, I just don't like it's it. It's a much. miss, but then also not a spectacular disaster like some misses can be. There are directors who have an amazing mm-hmm. track record. But um let's see my favorite director, Spielberg. There are some movies he's made where it's not just a miss, where it is it is a hard, hard miss. Like I think of, and you've never seen this movie, and I doubt many people out there have heard of this movie because people have just swept it under the rug, always, with Richard Dreyfuss <laughs> and Holly Hunter and John Goodman. Oh, I've never you seen don't. it. <laughs> it's, it's a waste of time. <laughs> no, it is. It, it's, it is weirdly weak. <laughs> but I can't say that with, with Crimson I believe Peak because, you. you know, there is, it does contain part of the things that he usually, you know, provides an A-plus effort. And yeah, I, I don't I don't think he, ga- I don't think he gave a less than effort. I think he, he made the movie he wanted to make. It just for, yeah, that's, you know, and I think that's what's right, so but interesting. We just don't I seem think. to connect with it all that much is the issue. Mm-hmm. So, which, you know, that does happen. It happens, you know. I think it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, yeah, happens. Just doesn't connect, doesn't hit. Oh, well. (laughs) Not terrible, not amazing, just like, all right. What what I think is more interesting, and this is another example as it was with Mimic, but um, he also mentioned this in some of the interviews I've seen talking about Crimson Peak, that he was, and I guess a reoccurring theme, the only reoccurring theme, I guess, from Mimic would be that this part was out of his hands entirely. But he was very dissatisfied with, um, was it Legendary, I think they said, uh, how they chose to market the movie. And we don't talk about all this often, but there are examples of films over the last couple of years that we have mentioned the marketing campaign for good and bad and, and how... Um, they paint the movie, but Del Toro, you know, calls it a gothic romance. Um, and he explains that the studio chose to market the movie as a straight up horror film. You know how I think the same things happened with, um, I don't, is it Darren Aronofsky? Is that the the director's name? Um, with yes. mother Jennifer uh, Lawrence, yeah, the same thing mm-hmm. happened. And I remember when that movie came out. I never saw it. And I think Peter, you were a fan of the film, but I remember when the movie yeah. came out, it was hated, hated because it was a movie that oh, was just not marketed in the trailers. To be, to be fair, I don't even know how you would even market that film. Uh, Crimson Peak or it's mother? It's just not. Okay, mother. <laughs> it's just not a wide audience kind of film. And in, the, um, and in this it, business, you but... have to understand that a wide, not a wide audience kind of film is a film that makes no money. 
Yeah. So that happened. A similar situation, I think, happened with Hereditary as well. Did it? Or or, yeah. or, or actually um, that the film wasn't all that well received by some audiences. Is maybe I'm, I'm, I'm... I just... Yeah. I just think it's a different kind of horror right. film. It is a horror film, clearly. But I, it's... It, it ain't Annabelle. So <laughs> differences, right? Um, but yeah, I think that definitely played in because ultimately Crimson Peak didn't perform all that well um, at the box office. No. I think I'm reading, I have it here in front of me that uh, um, it made something like it opened to $12 million, I think it said. Um, and then overseas. It earned thirteen million in its opening weekend. Um, I don't have in front of me a, a, a overall gross. I actually have it. I'm sorry. Here, it, it made forty three million in America, and then worldwide, it. I'm sorry. Altogether, it made seventy four million dollars with a budget of fifty five million. It sucks to say, but I don't think Guillermo has ever been a big money maker. At the box no, office. No, not even the blockbusters, really. His biggest successes are above breaking even. Yeah. It seems like. Which really sucks. Yeah. Because his movies are great. And it's also weird, too, because I don't I wouldn't say that he's necessarily a household name, but he's definitely a a known director. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know? So it's pretty weird that he's I don't think if you look money wise probably his biggest success was the last film he made I, I don't know for sure I don't have the numbers in front of me but I assume easily his biggest success I'll look it up was, when we uh, know, get to that movie so. uh, just to have it in front of me but yeah. um, I uh, interesting thing that I realized uh, when we were discussing about this film a few weeks back I believe this is 2015. At this point, you and I were working with each other on Barely a News Crew, and we were at this point well acquainted with each other. And what I find fascinating about this was how we essentially went to the theaters the same weekend, but we just saw different movies. Because, and I, it's fascinating, right? So, like, part of the reason why this movie wasn't doing all that well was because it was losing business to Ridley Scott and Steven Spielberg. So, The Martian and Bridge of Spies were actually released practically at the exact same time. And guess which movies I saw and guess, guess which I didn't. I saw The Martian and I saw Bridge of Spies and I didn't see Crimson Peak. But then again, at that point, I, at that <laughs> point, keep in mind this, it was sold as a horror movie and at that point I didn't do horror movies. So another example of how I've changed, but I, I'm going to assume, Peter, you did, you did not see Bridge of Spies. You did not see The Martian. I did not see... Bridge of Spies, and I dot, did not see The Martian, um, and I did see this. And in my defense, um, if similar films as Bridge of Spies and The Martian were to be released today, or at least in a time in the future when we can go to theaters, I still would not go to them. So that has shown how little I have changed <laughs> since... <laughs> <laughs> they're both great though um um i've yeah i love i was gonna yeah, say I, i've seen both yeah. I, I love bridger spies one of my favorite movies um and then kyle evidently um went so far as to say that he loves he, he said it was yeah. in his top three or maybe one of his his favorite movie of the last decade so i mean he really loves that movie i really like the the point of view of the martian mm. it's just this really pro science oh yeah sort of optimistic right. film where it's like we have a problem how do we fix it you know and it's and it's just like boom 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 and i didn't i i'll be honest i didn't expect it to be that no um but yeah i, re I really like that uh I really um i bring those movies up as an example of like how competitive sometimes the box office can be and you know what i was reading here did mention that both of those films spies and martian were overperforming and crimson peak was not underperforming yeah. but you know what i i actually those two films probably got some pretty good tomato scores uh i think even 
tomato wise and review wise crimson peak was just okay i don't think it was loved from what i understand no no i have it right here um rotten tomato score of 72 percent based on 275 uh reviews Yeah, it's not amazing. It's about average, I guess. Uh-huh. But then you also have to remember it's it's not that they think the film is like deserves a a grade of 74%. It's that 74% thought it was at least passable. Yeah. It also was kind of a blip. I I, I... I forgot the movie even came out, which is how little it was, how little talk it was getting. You know, at that point, I was regularly watching, um, you know, movie content, movie review content on YouTube. And that one was just one of those that was lost in the conversation altogether. That's why I forgot that it even came out um, among the, that, that time period. Yeah, because it was okay. Yeah. And I think people said that and then they moved on with their lives um yeah that's crimson peak it really is one of those films where i can imagine a different version and me just adoring it <laughs> that's true yeah but you know say lovey all right, then shall we move on to uh, The Shape of Water, the best picture winning The Shape of Water? I don't know. I don't know if it feels like we're being a little bit, I don't know, down this episode. We kind of were whatever in the last two movies. Ooh. But don't worry. This one will turn it all around, I feel. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know us. However we feel is just how we feel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The Shape of Water, directed by Guillermo del Toro. A fairy tale for troubled yes. times. Put that on the front of a newspaper. Mm -hmm. An otherworldly story set against the backdrop of Cold War era America circa 1962, where a mute janitor working at a lab falls in love with an amphibious man being held captive there and devises a plan to help him escape. And then of course, starring Sally Hawkins, Doug Jones, Michael Shannon, Richard Jenkins, Octavia Spencer, uh, and a bunch of others. So, uh, the way we feel about this film, I, it's pretty apparent. We have talked about this film many times. Um, have we we were both oh we had to have at least during oscars season i'm sure we did review didn't we when oh we went of course we did yeah but that was go I mean, see it, it. it's been a while ago at this point yeah i mean obviously yeah another thing to add on oh yeah i i hate oh, it okay great yeah go ahead <laughs> Another thing to add on to, um, you know, as a production, as a developmental note here, uh, Del Toro set the film during the 1960s Cold War era to counteract today's heightened tensions. He says, if I say once upon a time in 1962, it becomes a fairy tale for troubled times. People can lower their guard a little bit more and listen to the story and listen to the characters and talk about the issues rather than the circumstances of the issues. So in, in many interviews, he goes off about how prevalent uh, the times of which we're living in. Well, now we we did currently transition to a new era in American politics, but in the last in the in the years that this movie was made, it was very much a chaotic time um, for many people, a very unpredictable and unstable um, period of time. And it's interesting that this. Uh, well, I don't know if I should say it's interesting because he definitely, you know, in the, uh, in some of his movies, they do seem to 
on some level perhaps have been a bit uh, influenced by particular events, you know, in terms of, you know, the culture. I'm talking about the early movies, I think. But this... Specific, specifically Hispanic. Exactly. Though. This, however, perhaps more than all of them, seemed particularly birthed by the times in which we're living in at the moment. And, you know, we talk about how you know, there's this often paradigm shift in his films in terms of like, what's the real monster and what's the real human um, in his movies. And this perhaps may be the best example of it. And it very much is uh, perhaps not too subtle um, at times <laughs> with what it's trying to do and what it's trying to say. In ways that perhaps I may not have appreciated at the time of watching this a few years ago. That being said, though, when I saw the movie initially, I very, very much liked it. But since then, and having gone and you know, go, uh, upon further reflection and rewatches, I think this has become my favorite movie of his. Really? Yeah, it's it's between one and the other one. That's I think you know which two, but um, mm -hmm. no, I. I just love everything that Del Toro uh, was saying with this. And I also just think that it's a beautiful story in many ways. It's, it's a story about humanity. And in many instances, you see uh, very meticulous casting choices um, that make kind of a statement when you have the human characters uniting together against horror and evil. And it's, imbued in a particular face that we're all very well um accustomed to you know in our life and so that in it, it it's out there too a lot of the stuff that he does here i mean it's a romance about a fish and a and a mute girl i mean i don't know how you that and he think he said in interviews this must have been the worst pitch he's ever made um <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't do great pitches, um, unfortunately, which is, may have resulted in a lot of the projects that he's been involved with not getting made. But um, this, and, and he said several times, and I think he also said this in his acceptance speech, either in Best Director or Best Picture, that this movie saved his life. Um, you can definitely tell how much this movie meant to him. And uh, yeah, I, I think this is kind of perfect. He, I heard him in an interview say that this was the first film he made for his adult self. Mm -hmm. And I found that very interesting and in what that might insinuate about what sets this far, film apart from his past films. Because this film is on its surface very similar to even his earliest works. It's very much uh a fairy tale yes so that happens to involve uh, humans and mystical creatures and you know the whole shebang that you would find in a Guillermo del Toro film but I definitely think what sets it apart is the politics mm -hmm. and what he's speaking right. to. If you were to ask him his political leanings, he would probably tell you because I've seen him say it many times. He considers himself a humanist. Mm, yes. And <laughs> what that means, I think he explains it best, but it, it's, it's, I think just a profound sense of love for f your fellow man and your respect i to sum it up in so little words and his earlier films again specifically the spanish films they to me they they do speak more to almost childhood horrors and cautionary tales of the past you know what mm -hmm. i mean and 
this film, The Shape of Water, is the first one that doesn't feel like a cautionary tale of the past. Uh, it feels like a statement on today, even though... Or it, a it, cautionary it, tale of now. The present, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think when he talks about, you know, my previous films were for the child in me and this film was for the adult. I, I really feel that's that's what that mm -hmm. means. Just from looking at the film. I really, really like this film. We we've, we've talked about how we saw this, right? We live in um It's been a while, so you can on... go ahead and recount the story. It's a good story though. <laughs> we live on Tatooine. So we have to <laughs> travel off world a few hours. <laughs> travel off world to reach a movie theater that plays anything other than just blockbusters so we took a little road trip just to watch a double feature we saw this one and what else did we see spielberg spielberg the post meryl streep tom hanks the yeah. post that's right um <laughs> I was, for a second i was thinking jojo rabbit but that was another that double was feature another double did. feature yeah uh-huh that one, oh god, I loved that one. That one was yeah. great. Uh, in in which both of the films no, are pretty great in their own right. In, in their own right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But we saw the post, and then we saw the shape of water. And even from that first viewing, I really, really loved it. I thought it was really good. It's not my favorite Del Toro work. I, I, I think it's pretty obvious which one I think that one is. And I believe you said before, um, anyway. Oh, yeah, Pan, Pan's Labyrinth. Um, that, to me, is just... Perfection. It really is. Like, I'm not kidding. It's top ten, maybe top three. Like, it's it's a very, very... And we're being hypothetical because you, films. of course, are allergic to lists of any kind. So we can't really have any record to to pinpoint... Honestly, I've been thinking about trying to to go through the take on that cumbersome <laughs> uh what that task of trying to my favorite films of all I time. I asked you to name one movie that was your favorite of the 2010 decade and you froze. Because it's so hard. I get, I have to give it thought. Like if I decided today like I am going to do my top 10 10's too narrow 50 maybe I can start at 50 and then narrow it down to 10 uh, films of all time if I started today I would need a few months <laughs> to really just comb through it and, and double triple quadruple check but I think I'm at a point where maybe I could get there um, maybe but shape of water yeah no it, it's a it's a simple story it's a but it's very well told mm -hmm. and again speaking to the things he's trying to say <laughs> very very of the time unfortunately yeah which i think also says how how much hasn't changed because it's said in 1962 yeah so that really sucks ass. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what do you want to talk uh, about? Let's start with, with the casting, shall we? Um, we have some great casting in here. Oh, that's actually another interesting thing. The The main character. Uh, what's her name? Sally Hawkins plays the main character. Sally Hawkins. He wrote this Eliza. for Sally Eliza, Hawkins. Eliza, that's her name. Uh, the main character. And he basically wrote this movie with Sally Hawkins in mind. And he told this hilarious story. I think you want to tell it. You tell it. Okay. Well, uh, it turns out that hilarious run in he had with Miss Hawkins at a particular Hollywood event when he was, and he says this himself quite plastered on alcohol. Um, just he, he notices. Yeah. Just to, to chime in there. This is the, me and 
Mr. Guillermo agree 100% well, when it comes to alcohol, which is alcohol sucks. The only reason you would drink alcohol is to get drunk. You know, none of this casual drinker shit. You know, either you get plastered or you don't. So he was coerced into leaving his home to get plastered. With <laughs> Who were the other directors? Was Alejandro. Alejandro. And it was uh, Alfonso. Yeah. They're like, let's go to this Hollywood party. Let's get plastered. And he's like, uh, fine. There's basically and like then... me and Kyle trying to get you to get out of your house. That's the same story. <laughs> Because I mean, Kyle and I, it, yeah, when we enjoy to drink, um, mm-hmm. like I legitimately enjoy it, not just for like, I mean, I don't drink because I want to get drunk. I drink because I enjoy it. I guess that makes me weird. No, it makes me and Guillermo weird, but I I feel perfectly sane now because <laughs> you feel seen. <laughs> But yeah, uh, but the, the funny part about this is that he came across Miss Hawkins in the event and he just, he literally with him, um, imagine drunk Guillermo, uh, just blarts out to her, you know, in the middle of this event, like, Sally Hawkins, I'm writing a fish movie about you or something like that, you know, something to that extent. Uh, and that was pretty hysterical. Uh, I'm sure she was like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> But yeah, we have the casting here. Sally Hawkins as Eliza. We have Michael Shannon as the villain. Um, We have Richard Jenkins. We have Octavia Spencer. We have Michael Stuhlbarg, I believe. And we also have Doug Jones, starring Doug Jones in a way. Well, Sally Hawkins and Doug Jones as... uh, What do they call him? What's he credited as? The Beast or... Which is also hilarious to... The asset. The asset. Okay. It's hilarious to me how this is also a pseudo backdoor live action remake of Beauty and the Beast. At least to me, in my eyes. Um, which is hilarious because at one point, I think Del Toro was considering doing a live action Beauty and the Beast for Disney. So, Yeah, it might have been. Th- this really is his, his Beauty and the Beast mm-hmm. film. He talks about his inspiration for the film. And again, this really speaks to, to the mind of Guillermo del Toro. Um, watching the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah. And, oh, I love this know, story, man. I love this story. It speaks exactly to who he is. And when he says what he what you're about to recount what he said, it makes actually so much sense. Uh, <laughs> to not just to who he is, but and also like... That's a good point that no one else has ever brought up. Go ahead. Uh, when he was watching, when he was a child watching the creature of the Black Lagoon, uh, while everyone's looking at it as a horror film, he's he's viewing it as a romantic film. <laughs> and he was heartbroken <laughs> that the creature <laughs> and and the girl, you know, weren't didn't end up together in the end. And, you know, I I think there's a rather famous shot from that film where I think she's swimming and then he's underneath her, unbeknownst to her, like swimming back. And then with the the, the sun shining through and in his mind, like that was just such a beautiful thing that, you know, the, the two of them together. So his the shape of water is like him going back and fixing that yeah and i mean a particular part of that story he told is like i think the 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 creature the black lagoon is saving the girl i think from drowning or something and then the cops come and beat the crap out of uh the monster yeah well it's not the cops or the townspeople or something it's uh they're on a boat so i don't know they're in a black lagoon but it speaks to, you know, how uh, he really does uh, see monsters as humans or more human than human, really, in a way. And I think that, uh, look, it, that's just who he is. And I feel like he more than most, in, in fact, more than, uh, no, yeah, more than most people I would take a gander at, really does embody a particular... Um, value i wish most people have and here i'm not here to talk about like i'm not here to talk down to people 
I ain't the kind of person to say like, oh, you're living your life in the, in the wrong way. No, I mean, you do you, right? But I also um, feel in, in, in a way that perhaps Guillermo does that, um, I don't know, we've lost something, some kind of decency or courtesy about us or, or that way, but we've also lost the ability to have compassion or to sympathize with others in, you know, in mass. And him having the perspective of being able to just put himself in the shoes of a literal, you know, visually looking monster, I think really just speak to the humanist that he says he is. And I wish more of us were, quite frankly, a little bit more comfortable in putting ourselves in other people's shoes. That way we can understand the other person that we're so scared, threatened, or confused of, you know? And... I don't know. That resonates with me uh, very deeply when he when he talks about that. I mean, not that I myself <laughs> visualize, you know, like actual monsters in the same way that he does, but I definitely am somebody that um, very aggressively attempts to just do that simple act and try to look at the world through the lens of somebody else. And to keep that in mind and to let that guide you and inform who you are as a person. And to fuck fish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did get a poster for this movie and, you know, it is a pretty um, provocative image, shall I say, of the two embracing each other. So, um... I mean, I was pretty surprised how much he played up the... Uh creature angle because it's very much animalistic you know what i mean yeah no i mean the, you mean the the asset yes. yeah yeah he very much is that way um i i find it very humorous to me also how and he also seems to be pretty open about this is more than some other directors i know spielberg uh much like myself would be a little too embarrassed or shy to even um approach this but you know he 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 talks very open about you know uh, sexual relations in his movies and sexual romance as a big part of it and you know with this film he's very open with um you know the filming of and the and also the reaction to the sequence that was in this movie of um you know Eliza and the asset um doing it for lack of a better word um to be fair, there's no full on. Well, no, it's uh, it's not pornographic. I mean, it, it cuts away, which is kind of disappointing. <laughs> I was promised one thing, and I didn't really quite get it. But you know, it was a good film anyway. No, but I mean, you can definitely tell. Um, I love how he handles it within the next sequence. Um, you know, she's talking to uh, not talking, but she's uh, Octavia Spencer puts it together what they did and she's like just is reacting in the way we all would like she gives her this look like oh my god and then they have like further i think there's a sequence where she's like so how does it how oh, okay <laughs> you know just those weird really awkward questions about what would happen but it also at the same time i find quite beautiful because it, it reaffirms this notion that love can come from anywhere and can be as beautiful and as honest and as surprising as it can be. Um, yeah. And this is, you know, we want to talk about the other actors, obviously, in this. And we, we will get to Michael Shannon at some point. But, and it's been pointed out, I feel, by other um, cinematic scholars. I guess that's a way of putting it. About the themes in this movie. And I find it rather powerful in terms of like who the characters are. You have Eliza um, played by Sally Hawkins here. You also have, um, I believe his name is Giles, uh, played by, or Giles, uh, played by Richard Jenkins. And you also have um, Zelda, played by Octavia Spencer. You have uh, Dr. Hofstadtler. Uh, he's the Russian doctor, also a spy by Michael Stuhlbarg. 
And then, of course, you have the amphibian man or the asset played by Doug Jones. And I think what, you know what's, and I didn't realize this while watching it, but it was pointed out to me. The commonality between all of those characters is that they are all um, examples of people who are marginalized on the outskirts of what would be considered um, humanity. These are, you know, you have Zelda, Mm -hmm. who is black. You have um, Dr. Hofstetler, who is Russian. You have Giles, who is a gay man in the 60s. You have Eliza, who can't talk. And so, and she's mute. And of course, you have the amphibious man. And all of them together are perhaps, in, in this film, so beautifully used, you know, to be the best examples of humanity. Just by... Having compassion for, uh, you know, love and understanding. And of course, the villain, the real monster here, (laughs) is the straight white guy. It ain't subtle, guys. It ain't subtle what he does here. And I love that about him. (laughs) But they're all, like, uniting together. Why do you have to insert your politics into this, okay? Guillermo del Toro, another aspect I love about this guy is he... He is very committed to doing audio commentary tracks, except this for this movie. But in all of his movies, he's done audio commentary tracks. And he felt really obligated in a good way uh, to do those audio commentary tracks because of people like us who don't necessarily, you know, go to film school or have, you know, access to that. But he really grew up listening to audio commentaries that really informed who he was as a filmmaker. And he felt very much, I don't know, had a personal responsibility to do that. Um, But he also felt no need to do that with this movie. He personally says again and again that he left it all out there on the field. And either you get it or you don't, really, is how adamant he was about this movie. And um, that's how strongly he felt about it. Yeah, no, I think it's beautiful. I think it's wonderful. Um, Michael Shannon. Mm-hmm. Can we talk Michael about Michael Shannon. Shannon? He's hilarious. He's, in fact, a white male. Uh, but I will say the, 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 the defining factor isn't the fact that he's a white male. He just so happens to be a white male. The defining factor is that he is not on the outskirts of society. He is very much in control he's the power player he's the establishment yes Mm -hmm. now it just so happens that the white males more often than not are the uh establishment in our society but michael shannon is so good so very very good he is as we saw from knives out hilarious but even before he even showed some more of his comedic chops he has been sort of pigeonholed as the um the villain and he's so good at it like there's just something unnerving about michael shannon (laughs) yeah yeah like he's genuinely intimidating he's someone who if I saw him walking down the street, like I, I don't, I wouldn't approach him. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I know he's he's a he's a really fucking cool guy, but I don't know. Maybe he's having a bad day, and I don't want to. I would never want to find Michael Shannon on a bad day. But no, he really gives off that energy, and um, Guillermo utilizes it, I think, very well in this film. Also, we should mention... He's a real piece of shit. Yeah, we should mention... I know this is one of the big draws of the movie, um, especially when we walked out of this film, which was the visuals, right? The visuals, the, I mean, it, 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 it is beautiful. beautiful. Some of the effects that happened here, and you asked about what the budget of this was, right? Um, approximately in between 19 and $20 million. That's pretty damn low for for a hollywood film of this caliber like that's i thought 
30, 40, 50 range. Yeah. But that's another thing, too. Guillermo is, he just comes off, especially when he's talking, like he's a professional. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, he can, you give him a budget, he can do it. Yeah. He'll probably have you money left over by the end of it. Like, he just seems real good. So, yeah, that's, he's able to, the way he was able to squeeze every cent out of that 18 million, and it's all on screen, is a testament to his filmmaking capabilities. Because uh, we didn't talk about it much, but like the the visual effects of the the asset itself, oh, wow. very well done. Yeah. It, it's it's the best blend of CG and um, practical. Because you know, at the end of the day, practical effects and CGI are nothing but tools for the director. Mm-hmm. How you use them is up to, it's up to the director and they can uh, most of the time if you do it right they can complement each other beautifully and i think the asset itself is a big example of that uh, for the most part i believe the body even the light i think they i saw behind the scenes the light on the body you know how it's like translucent right or yeah yeah, yeah. i think that's paint like a specific paint wow. like that's not cg wow um the only real cg i believe is in the face Mm. so like maybe like growls and and stuff like that when it's when it's moving that but for the most part like everything else physically it's there 100 percent. so yeah and since we mentioned it was around what 19 million dollars that was the budget it grossed 195 million worldwide yeah, I'd call that a, a, a decent profit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, surprisingly so, in a, in a, as a matter of speaking, but um, it did very well for, it, for itself. It also um, appeared on... I mean, we should also you know, just mention that, of course, it was very successful among critics. It appeared on many top 10 lists, and it also ended up winning Best Picture. You know, which that was a moment that was surprising, you know, like this is not the kind of movie that you think would win Best Picture, much less. I don't think Del Toro has ever at that point won anything that big because in the same night he won Best Picture, but he also won Best Director for the first time. And uh, at that time, I think it was 25 years of filmmaking. Yeah, it really was the culmination of his career. Yeah, this film. It it's, and it's also in the filmmaking, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, the film has reminiscent, um, parts of it, from every point in his career. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He he really took all the lessons along the way, and it was just the right kind of film that hit at the right time, that was able to just, you know be critically a success you know academy wise you know award winning money wise audience wise and it was just it hit all cylinders i want to gush about the cinematography oh (laughs) my god this is this has got to be one of the best looking movies ever i mean not if we said about the visuals right and but like wow i love it also i love uh alexandre desplat's score Oh wow, that it it it's magical, like you know a fairy tale would. Be, oh yeah, is how it sounds like. Um, and and this is where I kind of nearly fell out of my seat, but just like wow, was of course the the random, not so random, but you know you're not necessarily expecting it. Um, but the musical sequence, the musical number, basically, where it kind of almost does become Beauty and the Beast. With uh, I think it was, it's sung to the song you'll never know. Yeah, and it, again, that's one of those sequences where uh, it could be really dumb, right? Like it could, 
it could just not work at all. Like, if someone was pitching me this scene, I would be like, so it's a comedy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, But it's just so sincere and and so well done and by the end of it i was like this is this is great like like i remember when that sequence happened i was like this is different it's great mm -hmm. it's actually working um i only a skilled storyteller i think can pull off that sort of bonkers <laughs> yeah sequence, and it yeah. still resonate emotionally you know, it, it it furthers to deepen your emotions about these characters, not pull you out of it. Yeah. There's some other moments I wanted to mention real quick, some details that I didn't catch in the first viewing, but make so much sense thematically. How, you know, after the amphibious man bites off, what's it called? Um, Michael Shannon, his fingers, and then they're reapplied, but all throughout the film they're rotting away and basically they're they're black dead and they smell and they're really indicative of like um the man basically i also really loved the details um like the scars that they ask eliza that's on her on her neck what they are and then they become gills um mm -hmm. at the end of the movie when she you know goes off with the amphibious man i really love that part about it uh, and great sequence uh, that's basically done in all sign language was when Eliza is like confronting Giles because she asks for his help to rescue uh, the amphibious man from the facility he's about to be executed. And then she has that wonderful monologue, of course, all through sign language about uh, something like if if we don't do this, we're not human, basically. That's the humanist and uh, Del Toro. Guillermo popping up again, yeah. No, those are great. Um, it seems as if we're just about at the end of talking about the movie in particular, but I think at this point we want to open up the floor if you have any other stories or, um, you know, discussion points about, you know, why Del Toro is such a great uh, filmmaker. But I actually do have something here, if you don't mind, Peter. Um, it's a pretty lengthy one, but it's one that I shared with you, and I think it's one of the mm -hmm. best quotes from anything ever speaking to uh turning the attention back on us the audience right in terms of how we absorb media how we and how much value we put in one thing or the other in this thing we called film and we call film so i have here this comes directly from the man i'm going to read this whole thing if you are ready for me to do so at a very early age I understood the value of visuals as a language. You know, we analyze our craft in the most pedestrian ways now. When you hear a movie discussed, to me, the least interesting thing is plot. It's the least interesting thing. And the thing I spend the least, the what, is momentarily interesting. The how, the where, the who, those are interesting things. We are an audiovisual art form, particularly cinema, which has a different gravity value in composition and in weight than other mediums, be it cable, TV, download, whatever. It has a particular weight, cinema. And when we discuss a movie, even critically, it discusses what is it about, what characters are in there, what are the plot points, Blah, blah, blah. We seldom discuss the style, which style is substance. In our craft, the style is substance. The difference between eye candy and eye protein. Eye candy is just there to please you. Eye protein is there to nurture the story, and color is a huge part of it. And I always say, the analogy of our craft with other crafts that are really analyzed is... If a painting by Van Gogh was a movie, you would say, how is the painting? Eh, it's about a bedroom and a bed and a chair and a window. Oh God, I'm not going to go see that. Is that the value of a painting? No. Why should it be the value of a movie? 
Movies are an audiovisual experience, and some of the most sacred, intimate moments that we have with movies are moments that are not possible to put into words. If you don't analyze them and decompose them into audiovisual elements, a turn of an actor that is hit with the light and the dolly pushes just so and the music swells and it's magic and we don't talk about our craft like that and it's really dangerous because we are writers and readers and if we write meticulously and we don't read meticulously there's a moment in which this communication and the sanctity of our craft is broken. There is so much there to really, I feel, guide us to the end of this podcast. Um, but I'm curious to hear your initial take on this very, I feel, um, important uh, quote that he has here. I would agree, agree wholeheartedly on his, his viewpoint of film. Um, We've talked many times on on how frustrated I, I get hearing the way some people speak about film, like it's this math equation that needs to be perfectly added and subtracted and, and multiplied and divided. And if you know you if you don't carry the one, see, mathematically you're supposed to carry the one here, and because of that, now your film is a failure because you didn't carry the one. It 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 broke everything. And films just are not that. They never have been. <laughs> films are an expression of ourselves. And it sometimes feels like there are two kinds of films to people. There is the extremely abstract, you know, where it's very interpreter interpretable and it's very weird. And then you have regular films that are supposed to be as realistic as humanly possible because realism is better for some reason. And then there, there is no in-between. You know, if, if you're in-between, you're a failure on some part, mostly because you weren't realistic enough. And it, <laughs> that's just not what a film is. And it's true. You see so much discussion being like, well, I found out this plot hole. Well, you know, scientifically, this shouldn't be able to work exactly how it's shown on film. And then it's this and it's that. And it's just so... And he's right. Like, no one talks that way about pictures. People don't just break down the plot and say, this is it. Uh... Well, no one just breaks down what's in the picture and say this is it. But no one. But also, when someone listens to music, they don't say like, mm, "These lyrics don't make sense, so it's a bad song." Like no one does that. <laughs> so I, I think it's beautifully put by him in, in his his view of film. There's a lot here. Um, I think the most on the surface of it at the moment is. Something it speaks to a frustration you and I have been having as of late. It's been there for a while now, but it only seems to have been um, aggravated, um, especially during the last couple of years. And I think um, that's why we spend a lot of time talking about also how certain, you know, um, pieces of content that we review are also uh, perceived by the main public and, you know, what popular opinion is. And a couple of examples of those happen to be what we've done here recently, which is The Mandalorian and WandaVision. Both uh, we've reacted in very different ways to from our personal perspective, but we also do analyze what the common talking points or the common opinions that people are having about this. And similarly, at this, you know, from our vantage point right now, we're recording this January 21st, 2021, right? So things can definitely change, especially with WandaVision. But at the moment, with that and with The Mandalorian, what we have been seeing is not just a, a large group of people who have the same opinion, not just what that opinion is, 
but then also how they reveal where that opinion comes from and they also how they inadvertently blurt out what they put stock in, what they value, how they ultimately determine the value of a piece of work, a piece of content, right? And Oof, I s- the C word. I said this in the WandaVision episode that I just did with Mr. Francisco, and that is um, with WandaVision, where we basically left any conversation about Easter eggs references as the very last thing. And I said, look, unlike a lot of people, and we've noticed this with Mandalorian especially, um, people are a particular popular talking point and line of thinking is the value of the content is ultimately determined not by story, not by weight or depth, characters or emotion or moments. However, it is the determinative aspect is what it's referencing to, what it, that it acknowledges the other particular pieces of media that are in this universe. And if it addresses it, and then it therefore has value. And that frustration is one that has been particularly percolating for with us for a couple of weeks now, seemingly driving us into complete and utter madness. And one that we talk about that because first and foremost, as I just said, it's driving us crazy, but it also has a place in film criticism. And I feel that seemingly is what Del Toro was speaking to because it's not just, you know, isolated to that. It, 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 it is a common thing throughout most particular pieces of content that we cover over. And that is the conversation that is being had. And it, it, it all of it is when he says this, um, that we are readers and writers. The writers are the filmmakers. The readers are us, the audience. We're the ones that absorb this content. If we write meticulously, but we don't read meticulously. That is, if the art is, you know, being made with as much care and devotion as it is, but we don't analyze it the way, in a way as it's, I guess, meant to. And I don't want to say that, you know, we should analyze it. I don't want to come off as saying like there's only one way you can analyze art. No, but I think film criticism itself in how we analyze certain things should be criticized. You and I should be you know given scrutiny and criticized for how we arrive at our opinions at certain things and we do it all the time you know sometimes we uh, and and we could fall you know victim to i don't know overhype syndrome or some other things like that you know or it wasn't what i wanted it to be we i feel talk about those elements in our review in our reviews because we feel it is a relevant talking point like how we just did it with soul and how much we wanted to love it but ultimately didn't feel the way that we wanted it to and how much that plays into our feelings but then also with all the bitching that we do with the other point of it you know so he is entirely right when he says that 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 is becoming dangerous because ultimately it results in more homogenized products that's why i was so concerned you know with Wonder Woman at 84 being as trashed and hated as it was, not because it was a bad movie, but because in how people were using it to say that it was bad. They were saying, oh, you know, it was, you know, it was a little cheesy. It was a little um, silly and it really shouldn't be that way. It should be serious. Okay. Like it, what I don't want is every movie to be the same thing. And that is what I feel is ultimately the end result of this danger that he is speaking to. How's that for a rant? <laughs> this, uh, I see this quote really awakened something. In <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like it kind of like it put all the pieces together. Mm. Oh, that's why I feel this way. You're right. And that's exactly how I feel. Um, is it okay if I share a quote? Real quick, because I, ha- I had another thing to say about this. When he says, um, this part where he says that the least interesting part about a movie is the plot. I, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And I love how he used that example of like 
the first thing anybody asks about a movie, if they want to see it, is what's it about? And I kind of am at the opposite way. The least interesting thing, let's say for the WandaVision, is the story. It's about the characters. It's about the genuine human emotion that you get from it, you know, like in all the other stuff. But that 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 in itself, too, is unfortunate how much value, whether somebody wants to see something, depends on what's it about. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Um, I thought you shared a wonderful quote on his point of view of film. Um, the quote I'm going to share is about himself, the man. It is his foreword to the book Guillermo del Toro, At Home with Monsters, Inside His Films, Notebooks, and Collections. And this was made in the, I believe, spring of 2016, or it was written in the spring of 2016. So this, it's a, it, much like Mr. Soto's, it's a bit lengthy, but I also believe it gets to the heart of really himself um, in his own words. So here we go. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> he has the book in front of him. <laughs> When I was a child, a very young child, a hairline fracture became evident in my soul. I felt growingly disenfranchised, puzzled, and at odds with the adult world. It was made up of rules and notions that were both alien and unexplained. You need to stop and reading. Stop reading right now because holy shit, holy shit, I feel the same way right now. <laughs> I feel the same way. I'm sorry. Could go on, go on. But No, 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 no. If something speaks wow. to you, just let me know. Like, wow, man, that, that's exactly how I feel. Wow. <laughs> it was almost entirely composed of lies. Adults lie to themselves and to others. They endorse their concerns and inventions, the ones they all agree to. Money, power, war, repression, as real. But fantasy is found upon as childish. For some of us, it is not. I believe that we are all birthed with a certain quality of glass within us, and that we resonate with specific vibrations, notes of the universe. The note I resonate with is low, dark, and full of monsters. Seeing one of my favorite creatures, I turn into Bernini's St. Teresa or Stendhal contemplating Giotto. I, I shoot, I butchered that. I was lost when they found me, the monsters. Lost like Mowgli in the jungle, like Romulus and Remus in the Tiber, <laughs> Tiber. And these beings gazed upon me with kindness. They too were outcasts of this absurd world that demanded impossible perfection and gave nothing back. They were the antipodes of perfection, defined by their condition, disposition, and appearance, and wanting simply to exist. But existing was hard for a monster, chased by torch-wielding lunatics, bombarded with missiles, trapped in cages, stoned away from placid, rustic villages. To me, every universal monster film turned into a, a hagiography and every creature a martyr. Frankenstein's monster emerged as a messianic, messian, messianic? messianic yes, figure, one who died and was resurrected and died again for our sins. Monsters are, to this day, true family to me. They are not effigies collected for profit or due to a completist mania. In Bleak House, I have built a temple to them, and within them I have built devotional shrines. I serve them, a power greater than myself, with abandon and unwavering dedication and love. I built a house made of books, art, films, and monsters. A house of many stories, dark and stormy stories. A house with secret passages and sliding bookshelves and portraits that follow you as you walk by. I dreamt it all those years ago, alone in the dark. But I only got to build it at age 44. This museum exhibit is an act of love. 
earnest love for the odd and the marginal that tries to am a god i'm so bad at words you guys know this amalgamate things amalgamate high amalgamate oh is that it maybe high and low brow as objects of wonder in a cabinet of curiosities where pleasure never meets guilt i am 52 as of writing this and i am still most at peace when i am with the oddities the lost ones i have devoted most of my life to preach their simple gospel there is another world a more forgiving and encompassing world where the arrogance of angels does not weigh so heavily upon our souls and where reason sleeps and we thrive as the patron saint of imperfection and there we sing gobble gobble we accept you one of us will you join us now um <laughs> i really like that forward it's really nice I think it, he he very much knows himself, and I think that's that's fantastic because not a lot of people do, not a lot of people are capable of that. Um, <laughs> I yeah, I I just I don't got much comment. Just I just I love that that forward. That um, <sighs> among the many reasons for why I admire him. Um, and this actually perhaps has nothing to do with film, really. It's not just that I admire him as a filmmaker. I really admire him as an individual, as a person. Um, and in many ways, he, he really helps articulate, um, really what I am like in some ways as well. Like in a lot of the things that he spoke to in that foreword, um, actually reminded me of like myself as well like i've always been you know the kind of person to just like question why things the way that they are before i even like had any concept of political theory mind you or notions it was always i was always a very curious person just like asking well why is it done this way and also, aren't there much better ways to do this? Isn't like this a huge waste of time? I've always had a low tolerance for bullshit too. It's like if this is a stupid <laughs> reason, also I'm, I don't really I don't put up with it all that much, and I also have never been afraid to call it out, as you know. Um, not isn't to say, of course, that I was always right, and hardly ever am these days, am I? Um, but I always felt like how he described it as such about you know. Um, just not understanding the adult world all that much, especially with how it's right. And I think you and I, you know, with having a particular passion, a similar passion with American politics, and we have this obsession, it seems like, because uh, at least why I care so much about that is because well, I'll just borrow his terminology for it. I'm a humanist. You know, I, I, I want people to be happy. I want people to have a good life. And politics, I learned at a very young age. Um, that can be a very determinative factor in how you live your life or how you can live your life. And I feel like, you know, movies in and of themselves, uh, you know, as an expression of art, as an expression period, uh, invariably can comment and help you visualize, you know, what exactly that is. And then when he says also to um, feeling most at home, with what are considered to be the outcasts of uh, the world. Well, in a similar scape, I will say that there are other places that I've lived in in my life. And let's just say they were close to the power players in the world. And I didn't care for it. <laughs> and I didn't I didn't care for it in the slightest. I, I found myself surrounded with frauds, fakes, phonies. Not all of them. I had some there were those genuine stars that you find, but they do not originate from those places, I would add. They come from other places, the real world as they say. But I often find myself most at home not with people who are like exactly like me. 
I, I, I find myself most at home with people who are honest and genuine in who they are as they are. I am very attracted to people who know who they are and who are good people, really. And also have this understanding, as we all should, the world is a piece of shit. It doesn't have to be, but it is. And there are a group of people who like to keep it the way it is, and they suck and need to be destroyed at all costs. Um, and there should be a much better world waiting for us. One that is filled with humanity, com compassion, and love, and respect for everyone. And that's the world we have to strive to. Because the one that we live in right now ain't that... And it also comes down to our generation because I feel like, well, maybe not our particular generation, but at least um, people our age have this particular sense, maybe more, I feel more than any other normal, you know, generational change. Like we, you and I wake up every single day of our lives, at least we did in the Trump administration, and we definitely still have that, we will have that with this Biden administration. But just realizing and coming to terms with man, I am really out of step with the people of this planet. And sometimes the meme by Professor Far that features Professor Farnsworth from Futurama <laughs> with an angry old man saying, I don't want to live on this planet anymore, comes into my mind at least several <laughs> times a day. Um, I mean, um, when it comes to you, you know, feeling... Uh, a kinship to what Guillermo del Toro says. I, I, I will admit when I think of you, I do think of, you know, monsters. So I, I because I that's exactly what I was trying to convey. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> that, that, that's what you took out of all of this was all right. You were just, were you just waiting for me to shut up so you can call me a monster? Yes, I was, Holy I was holding on to that for like five minutes. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> are you happy now are you satisfied that you let it out i am very satisfied i don't know if i could hold it in any longer <laughs> that other stuff was nice too I just feel like what I told you. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people don't get me and they don't get where I come from. And I feel like he does. And I relate to that. If, <laughs> this isn't me down, like, you know, minimizing that connection you feel, but it, it does remind me of like a teenager when like oh, listening to, to a band's lyrics. Like, oh my God. This band gets me. The music speaks to me. Again, it's not minimizing, but it just kind of reminds me. But no, but like that's that's the beauty of art, right? Like, yeah, even talking about like the you know the music and that teenage situation. Um, no, I I agree. I resonate a lot with what he says. The way um, I've loved monsters all my life. <laughs> I have. I mean, you've seen my room. I have a. I I have a masks that litter. The, just like kind of, next to my bed, and I mm -hmm. don't know. I. The one thing I'm not is a fucking poet the way he is. Right. <laughs> they just can, articulate every everything that he um he feels. So it's it's really comforting when when you feel certain ways but you just don't have the capabilities to voice that or mm -hmm. really take those jumbled feelings and and make words out of them. Right. Someone as um emotionally intelligent as Guillermo to be able to to do for him to be able to do that and then you know 
me and us read it. Yeah, it's it's pretty cathartic. I it guess, is. Like it that. very much is. That's the right way of putting it. He's a neat dude. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I feel that's all that needs to be said. I mean, there's a lot we've talked about with his films and with him personally, but I think uh, I feel like this is perhaps the proper place to come to a close to. And yep. we will be back later in the year to review, hopefully later in the year, 2021, to review his latest movie coming to Netflix. Actually, he has another film coming. I think maybe the Netflix one, I don't know if it's pushed off or what's, but he does have another film. It's like, fuck, what was it called? I literally just saw... It's, um, give me one second. So you don't know if the Netflix one is happening after all, or if it's been pushed? And it is an open question because as we noticed, he has a very interesting track record of, you know, projects of, you know, at one point being very involved with and then unfortunately not moving forward. Okay. Well, it's just because if you look at the, what's the word? the the release schedule right or not even the release schedule you just look it up and you look at the film it says 2021 right Mm. but there has been no word of mouth or movement or anything there's been no words basically yeah word at all so i don't really know but there is word about guillermo del toro's um film called nightmare alley which will release in 2021 this year uh the film is a it's a remake of a 1947 noir film interesting let me see oh, okay yeah see look okay it says the film will be del toro's return to live action cinema after the shape of water's best picture went into 2018 del toro will also bring a live action adaption of pinocchio to netflix this year but it says live action I'm pretty sure it wasn't live action. I thought we were talking about it being in stop motion animation. Last we we, we brought it up. Uh, Yeah, I I think we're just going to have to wait until we get (laughs) literally anything on that film. Yeah. That Pinocchio film. But Nightmare Alley um, explores the dark underbelly of show business with the official synopsis pitting Bradley Cooper's manipulative, manipulative Carney and Kate Blanchett's mysterious psychiatrist head to head um it's a period setting obviously uh so yeah it i love it already <laughs> yeah feels like another one of his adult films <laughs> though all of his all his films are technically you know for well not all but all of these um non-blockbuster films are have been adult films but this feels like it's made for the adult in him specifically uh yeah from what i'm seeing it's december this for nightmare alley so that means they're going for awards so yeah something to hype you up there for well, we need some kind of movies to come out this year, right? So, yeah. Get out at Biden. Vaccinate yeah. everything and everyone. Well, thank you all for listening so much to this. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion. And if you want to hear more of our you know, coming discussions, we've got some stuff coming up. Next week, we're going to be reviewing Boys State, documentary by A24 on Apple TV+, Plus, Peter and I. And then February feel good february is back we've got two movies that we'll be talking about in that month and to the table right to the table specifically and so much more coming every single sunday sometimes on thursdays anywhere you listen to podcasts apple spotify castbox fm and youtube thank you all for listening we'll see you next time and stay under the spotlight bye-bye